Luke chapter 4. Let's uh, begin reading in verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and sat him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. This last temptation that we are studying is where Satan is tempting Christ to cast himself off the pinnacle of the temple. In this temptation, we realize that Satan will use any means necessary to get us to sin. He will stop at nothing in order to get us to sin. And so because he will use anything and everything he can to get us to fail God, we must always be on guard and resist the temptation. Today, first of all, I see here the place of the temptation. The place of the temptation in verse 9. It says he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. So he, uh, the place of this temptation is, become, is important because for Satan, or excuse me, it's important for Satan because it gave him a great advantage. We notice the place was Jerusalem, and even more specifically, it was the temple. You see, Jerusalem was the holy city, and the temple was the holy place. And this leads us to understand that Satan will stop at nothing in order to uh, uh, disguise temptation. He will even use sacred things to disguise temptation. And it also shows us that Satan has no respect whatsoever for uh, sacred things. And we need to keep this in mind because, you know, uh, a lot of times sin happens in the church. <laughs> and people think just because you go to church that you may be exempt from sin, but that's not so. A lot of times sin and uh, some wickedness happens in the church and uh, in um, uh, ministry type activities. And so we need to be on our guard in any place. Amen. We notice in the Bible we see an example of someone using sacred things uh, for evil. Remember when Saul disobeyed the Lord and kept some of the spoils to offer a sacrifice. If you would please turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We'll look there at that instance. Hold your place here in Luke chapter 4. But in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, we see here an example where Saul had used sacred things in order to do something uh, that, was, that was wicked, that was rebellious in the eyes of God. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse uh, 13. And Samuel, uh, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now before we go on any further, we need to establish what the commandment was to do. What the commandment was to Saul. Saul was commanded to uh, kill everything that lived. He was commanded to kill everything. He wasn't, he wasn't to take anything, any spoils back with him. Look at verse 14. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So Saul come up to Samuel and he says, I performed the commandment of the Lord. And then Samuel said, Well, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? <laughs> you know, that's odd, isn't it? He, he was told to kill everything, and then he comes out and says, well, I obey the Lord, but he left some of the uh, sheep uh, living. You know, if, if we're not careful, we'll do, we'll do that sometimes to God. We'll say, oh, well, I'm okay. I'm obeying God's commandment when actually it's the complete opposite. And so Samuel didn't see anything wrong, or excuse me, Saul. He didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing. Look at verse 15. And Saul said... They have brought them from the Amalekites 
for the people spared of the best of the sheep and of the oxen. And then he says this, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So Saul said, hey, well, we, we destroyed everything except the best. And what we were going to do with that was we were going to offer that to God. Now listen, offering sacrifice is not a bad thing uh, for God. Especially there in the Old Testament, giving something to God as a sacrifice. It's not a bad thing. But it is when God tells you not to do it. When God gives you a command to do something. Now look, let's read on to verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Here we see uh, Saul continue to say, I've obeyed God. I haven't disobeyed it. He says, And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, uh, Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. <clears throat> but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. And it says, To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel saith, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. You know what he's saying there? He's saying it's better to obey God than to give God a sacrifice. And so here we see how Saul was uh, uh, submitted himself to do wickedness before God, and he was using a sacred thing to do it. And so listen, we need to be careful that we're not tempted to do something in the midst of sacred things. You know, the problem today with many churches is that they have men like Saul in charge of them. They don't see anything wrong with offering worldly activities in the church. Uh, listen, our church is different than most churches around this, uh, uh, around this valley. The reason we're different is because we want people to, uh, to understand that God changes a man's life. We don't offer worldly things in this church. We don't bring the world's music into this church. Well, because we are the uh, church is a place to be sacred. And we try to keep anything out. Hey, listen. If we allow the things of the world in this church and that kind of music and things like that, that's what that's the kind of things that people are tempted with. And why would we bring that stuff inside this church when this is supposed to be a sacred place? And so we need to be careful. And I see this in a lot of churches. Listen, I know of a church today. They claim to be independent Baptists, just like we are. You know what? They set up shop in a in a comic club. They, they, they set up church in a comic club. And then they have all kinds of uh, worldly music and activities and things. When people come there, they don't know if they're going to a comedy club or going to church. And then when they have, uh, they don't have any kind of sacred music and so forth. Hey, listen, we want to be separate from the world. And we, we need to realize that God makes a difference in, in a man's life. He changes your life. And in this, hey, church ought to be a place where people can find a refuge from the things of the world. And so that's why uh, we sing the, the old timey hymns. That's why we sing them. That's why uh, we preach like we do. It's supposed to be the ground and the pillar of truth. It's supposed to be where we're separated from the world. Yet today, churches don't look much different from what the world is offering. So first of all, I see this as the place of temptation. Secondly, I see the perverting in the temptation. Now, the tactic that Satan uses next is very dangerous. In previous temptations, Christ used the Word of God to overcome temptation. Remember that. Every time we look at the temptation that Christ was tempted with, in order, in order to overcome that temptation, he used the Word of God, didn't, didn't he? And we'll actually look at that in just a minute, how he used the Word of God here. But now, Satan is using a different tactic against the Lord. What's he doing? Satan is actually using the Word of God as a, a, a way to tempt Christ.
Christ. And so we see that he is perverting the word of God. Look at verse 9. He brought him to the Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and sent him to him. He says, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written. Here's Satan getting ready to quote the word of God. It is written. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, if you want to mark this in your notes or in your Bible, Satan is quoting from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. He is using those verses to say, to tell Christ that if he were to cast himself down, God would save him. The problem is that Satan is taking those verses out of context and twisting it to get Christ to do something that is contrary to God's word. Now, in context, Psalm 91 is teaching us that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus and remain faithful to him, he will protect us when trouble comes our way. That's what Psalm 91 is teaching us. In Psalm 91 verse 2, it says, I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. And by the way, Psalm 91 is a great song for the Christian. It's, it's something that we can all rejoice in. That we can trust in God. He is our refuge. He is somebody that will take care of us in times of trouble. But it doesn't teach us that when we do something stupid and bring danger to ourselves, that God is going to keep us from getting hurt. That's not what it says. Psalm 91, verse, beginning verse 9, he says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Verse 10 is a good verse. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And this is something that Satan left out. In all thy ways they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore, he says, will I deliver him? I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. And then he says, I will deliver him and honor him. So we see here that it teaches us, hey, if we, if we uh, uh, put our faith and trust in God, he will take care of us when danger comes our way. And he will, he will protect us or he will deliver us. Now listen, now, now we, we also have to realize when this was written. This was written to Israel. This was written in the Old Testament. We have some newer revelation since the time that that was written. We understand, even by Hebrews 11, that not everybody that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ were delivered and when, when evil came their way, as far as the world is concerned, as far as the world would look on it. But I tell you one thing, they were delivered when they got to heaven, amen. <laughs> Thank God for that, amen. And here's the thing, so we, we got to realize that God can take care of us. God can deliver us when evil comes our way if we trust in Him. But He might not on this side. But He, but he definitely will deliver us if we put our faith and trust in Him. Some way or another. <laughs> you know, it's like the old preacher used to say. He said, hey, if I die, it's okay. It's okay if I die in the midst of trouble when it comes my way. He said, if I go or if I stay, I'm a winner either way. <laughs> God can take care of us. He takes care of his own. Amen. Thank God for that. But what Satan is doing, he's saying, hey, listen, you go up to the top of this building, you throw yourself off. He said he'll take care of you. Well, you know what? That's foolishness. Because that's not what God is teaching in that scripture. And so the, the reason this is so dangerous is that the Bible can be twisted in order to say whatever you want it to say. And that's absolutely right. 
Any man can take this Bible and twist it to say anything they want to say. Let me ask you this. Is every statement in this Bible true? Is every statement in this Bible true? Absolutely not. You say, well, how come we should trust it if it's not true? I didn't say it wasn't true. I just said every statement in this Bible is not true. You remember when Aaron, Moses was on the mountain, and Aaron, uh, he led the people into idolatry, didn't he? And when Moses came off the mount, Moses looked at Aaron and he said, Hey, what, how in the world did this happen? I'm paraphrasing, okay? But here's what, here's, what, uh, here's what Aaron said. He said, Yeah, they gave me all their jewelry. They gave me their rings and their earrings and their bracelets and everything. And I threw them in the fire. And out came this calf. It's one of the stupidest things I've ever read in the Bible. Honestly. Was that a true statement? No. Now the account that was given to us is true. You see, they told the truth about a man telling a lie. <laughs> and so I hope you understand that not everything in this, every statement in this book is true, but the account is, that was given is true. And so when people say, well, I don't believe the Bible... Because there's contradictions in the Bible. You ever heard people say that? They say, well, you know, the Bible has contradictions in it. Well, they're right. Wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. Because we find all the time when there are men contradicting the commands of God. <laughs> we find that. Now, I don't believe the Bible will teach one thing in one area and teach something completely different in another. I don't believe there's contradiction that way. But I do find that there's people that do contradict God's command in the Bible. But you know what? Every cult that teaches a false doctrine twists the scriptures in order to teach their doctrine. They'll take the word of God and they'll change it. They'll make their own version to teach what they want to teach. Do Jehovah's Witness do that? They do. They say that Jesus Christ is not God. And so you know what they did? They took their, they, they made their own Bible to teach that Jesus Christ was not God. That Jesus Christ is a God, but he's not the God. Well, that's com completely contradictory to the Word of God. And so they changed it. They twisted Scripture. You know what? The Catholics do the same thing. You know what? The Mormons, they take, they take verses out of this book. They took verses out of this book and they twisted it and they put it in the Book of Mormon to teach their doctrine. And so, listen, anybody can take this Bible and teach whatever they want to teach. And I try to tell people as I'm knocking on doors and as I'm uh, trying to, uh, you know, let people know that we're here and we're trying to witness to people. You know what I do? I tell them, I preach this book the way it was given. The way God wants us to hear it, I don't try to twist it. Because people that do that are trying to control you. God help me, I'm trying not to ever to control you in any way. And so uh, we see that the word of God can be twisted, so we must be careful. And so the lesson for us to remember is that Satan can and will use anything in order to get us to fall. And so we must be on guard for anything. So I see the place of the temptation. I see the perverting in the temptation. And then last of all today, I see the power over the temptation. Now, in every, in every of the, each one of these temptations we've looked at, we've noticed the power over the temptation. We see this one in verse 12. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said... Or in other places, I believe in the, or excuse me, in the book of Matthew, he said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so just as in other temptations, Christ used the word of God to overcome temptation. And so each time we notice that Christ knew what the word of God was, and he obeyed it. You know what? That's important for us too. We must know what the word of God is. In order to overcome temptation. He, Jesus said, hey, it is written. Or it is said. You know, uh, I think we've mentioned this in the past weeks. 
We don't say, you know, Christ didn't say that. He didn't say, no, I shouldn't do that. Or I don't feel like doing that. Or maybe that wouldn't be good. He said, it is written. And that's the greatest tool that we have to overcome temptation. Because listen, what if Satan comes to you and you get tempted to do something wrong? What if you say, I don't feel like it, or I don't think I should? Maybe one day you might think it's okay. But if we have the Word of God and we know what it says and we know that there's a command against it, we can say, I can't do this. It is written that I can't do this. Now remember, I believe we uh, 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 talked about Joseph and how he was tempted to do wrong. He said, how can I do this sin against God? Joseph probably didn't have much of the Word of God. But you know what? He still realized that he had a relationship with God. Here's the thing. When we are tempted to sin and we decide we are going to sin, you know what happens? We completely forget about God in our relationship to him. People never really thought about that, but that's exactly true. That we completely forget about God and that we belong to him. But if we hold on to this Bible and we uh, know what this Bible says, you know the Bible says that we, uh, I'm talking to saved here, that we are adopted into the family of God and we are His children. How can we do this sin against God? But then next, Christ said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord. So He not only knew what he, it said, but He obeyed it. Our victory relies not only on knowing it, but also obeying it. The more you try to live according to the Bible, the easier it will. It will be for you to resist temptation. I believe we said that maybe every week we studied this. If you are in the habit of living according to God's word, then when temptation comes your way, it will be easier to resist it. So as we close, I want to look at verse 13 in our text. It says, when the devil had ended all the temptation, this is some interesting words here, he departed from him for a season. Just for a season. The wording indicates that Satan came back to tempt Christ later on. You know what? We find ourselves in the same temptation. Or excuse me, the same situation. You know, a victory over temptation today does not guarantee your victory tomorrow. Now I will say this, that if you have victory over temptation today, then tomorrow your victory will be easier. Or can be easier. But it does not guarantee your victory. Satan will be back to tempt you. You know, I believe when Satan departs, it's often a tactic Satan uses to get us to kind of relax our guard just a little bit. Because there's sometimes when he comes and we're not even expecting it. Uh, I've talked to Pastor Shelton before, my pastor back home, and I've asked him some times, you know, have you ever felt, you know, because there's been some times he's been into in some great revival meetings. And it just felt like God just gave the victory. People getting saved, people getting right with God, He's preached those things that God used him to do something great and mighty uh, of the Lord. What a blessing it was. But it's almost like every time after those great victories that God gives, Satan begins to attack him. Begins to attack after a great victory. Hey, that's what happened to Elijah, didn't it? Remember Elijah, he was there on the mountain. He proclaimed victory for the Lord. I, I mean, he challenged all those prophets of Baal and the people said, uh, came to the conclusion that they were going to serve God and what a great victory it was. And then he prayed and then there was a rain and hey, and God just walked a great victory uh, with him. But then what happened? Oh, Jezebel got after him and said, hey, if I find him, I'm going to kill him. Like he did all those prophets. You know what he did? He went and sat down on a juniper tree and uh, began to feel sorry for himself and pity. You know what? God spoke to him after that and, and, and tried to encourage Elijah. 
But that was something Elijah never got over. We don't see Elijah doing much after that. You know what? After a great victory, it's almost like Elijah just left the scene just completely. We have to be careful. When we, we have great victory, we need to realize that Satan may leave us for just a season, but he's coming back. The Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so we need to, in every case, be careful, be vigilant. If, we, if God gives us victory over temptation, thank God for it. We're glad for it. But watch out. Satan may come any moment. I read a quote here. I'm going to read it to you. Let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. Let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father.